Hey, hello, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man. I'm Stan Osterman, coming to you live and direct from the North Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. As you can tell by the lava flows and the ocean in the background, and I've got co-hosting with me today Paul Pontio, the uh, the guy in charge of all the engineering feats and magic with hydrogen here at Blue Planet Research here on the Big Island. And um, our guest today is Mr. Andy Belt from, and correct me if I'm saying this wrong, Ginner. Um, they make. Oh. Go. Oh. No, Stan, Stan. No, Gina. Gina. I didn't get I didn't get my education right. So Giener, and they make uh, electrolyzers and have for many many years, but have decided that they wanted to go commercial. They split their research um, hydrogen branch off into a commercial branch, and they're growing like gangbusters. So, Andy, thank you for being on the show today. And I'm sorry we couldn't get you connected via the video, but we've got your picture up on the screen and. Um, why don't you uh, introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a little bit about Giener. Thank you, Stan. It's a great pleasure to be on the show. I, uh, I, uh, I wish I could be there with you. Here in uh, Newton, Mass, it's uh, below freezing, but, um, but uh, it's just great to be uh, in connected with Hawaii this evening. Um, I, uh, so I'm a, a South Londoner I, uh, from the UK. I uh, have uh, done a bunch of things in my life. I've always enjoyed uh, startup businesses, taking technology to the next level, translating technology to com into the commercial market, and I've had the great good fortune to, to work in several uh, industries. But the best uh, experience I've had professionally is working with Gina. Gina is just a great company. As you said, it's, uh, it's been in the hydrogen space for many years. It's been in business for uh, close to 50 years, founded by Jose Gina, who was a, a PhD electrochemist, came over to the US to work at uh, Tyco. And uh, he had the opportunity to start up his own business when Tyco decided they didn't want to continue doing research in uh, fuel cells and electrolyzers. And he set up his own business here in, in this area, in, in just outside Boston, Waltham, and Newton area. And for, uh, for the majority of the life of the company, we've been very focused on electrochemical R&D, so advanced chemistry batteries, uh, fuel cells, electrochemical sensors, uh, electrolyzers, of course, um, regenerative fuel cells, that's been the core. Of the core of the of the company was was uh, was built around um, R and D and doing R and D programs for commercial companies and then also for government agencies. And uh, then the, a major development about uh, the mid eighties, the, there was a group of uh, specialist electrochemists who had worked for GE in Lynn, Massachusetts and been part of the, of the earliest development of PEM electrolysis, which is one of the, one of the two major technologies for, uh, for electro, electrolysis of water. And uh, we, uh, Gina had the great good fortune when, when GE decided that that wasn't, uh, that the PEM electrolysis business wasn't something of, of any great commercial interest. We had the great good fortune to, to uh, recruit a, a core team of the, of the leading electrochemists from that, from that team. And um, that, uh, they became a key part of GINA. We still have one of them working with us today. And uh, uh, since then, we've really, the crown jewel of the GINA technologies has been, has been PEM and PEM electrolysis uh, in particular, uh, fuel cells and, uh, and, and electrolysis. Um, we had a, what's another key, a key moment for us also was then in, in, in around 2000, General Motors was looking at getting into fuel cells, starting up a fuel cell program, and we, um, we uh, formed a joint venture that lasted for over 10 years working with General Motors on uh, helping them with their, with their fuel cell program, and we still do work with them today, the, the joint venture has wound down, but we still work with General, General Motors today on their, on their fuel cell activities. Um, so uh, then take, that takes us through to the uh, 2000s, and in the 2000s we began to market our electrolyzer capabilities. 
and we had uh, had the opportunity to bid on a Navy program, a U.S. Navy program, to supply electrolyzer stacks for life support oxygen applications on uh, on U.S. nuclear subs. And we won the contract with our partner in uh, Connecticut, and uh, we've been a supplier to the U.S. Navy now for over 15 years. And that's been a, a very important uh, uh, commercial opportunity for us. And then we began to build smaller stacks, electrolyzer stacks, PEM stacks, for laboratory hydrogen applications, on-demand hydrogen for laboratory equipment. And that's been a great business with us, with uh, a couple of partners in that business in the UK. And we now have tens of thousands of uh, GINA electrolyzer stacks around the world in these life support um, applications and also in in uh, on-demand hydrogen generation for for uh, uh, laboratory equipment and and uh, and moving then into the uh, into 2010s we began to develop larger commercial stacks and to explore commercial markets for for larger commercial electrolyzers and that has been a great success for us as you mentioned Ben bringing us up to date about three years ago we created a standalone company because we saw the real growth opportunity in renewable energy storage. And that's the key driver of the GINA ELX business today. So GINA ELX, a PEM commercial, PEM electrolysis business that we created from, uh, from about three years ago. And the core uh, objective for GINA ELX is taking advantage of the incredible opportunities in the hydrogen economy, specifically renewable energy storage, and then using the hydrogen for uh, many, many uh, major uh, applications, um, ranging from industrial applications of hydrogen through eventually to mobility applications. So it's uh, just a, a really an amazing time to be in the in the PEM electro electrolysis business today. That's that's a great summary, and Yen. Uh... Well, I was really impressed with talking to you was when you told me that um, you were contracted by the Navy to do electrolyzers for their submarines. I don't know if uh, the viewers understand what kind of rigors you have to go through to get to that point where the Navy will actually put that equipment on a nuclear submarine. It's an incredible and very rigorous um, testing program that uh, really says a lot for your company that the quality and the durability and uh, everything that you need to put into a military contract, uh, it, it meets the bill. In fact, we have a saying in the U.S. of uh, close enough for government work. And we used to, we, today we, we think of that as not very good, but the original, uh, when it was originally started as a saying, it actually meant the government had such tight specifications that if it was close enough for government work, it couldn't be any better. It was really tight specs. Mm -hmm. So you've obviously broken the code on that, and that's that's really important. Now I've got Paul on the on the line here, and I told him that you were working on a um, on a pressurized off the stack electrolyzer. Could you, Paul? Could you ask him some questions about that that you might think of? Sure. Yeah. Uh, first of all, what what type of bar pressures are you achieving from the stack? I'm afraid I can't hear Paul if yeah. Paul is speaking. Uh, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to relay for you, Paul. He was saying, "What kind yeah, of pressure so are you getting the off pressure. the stack?" Oh, oh, we, uh, Paul, look, we can uh, we can run hydrogen pressure at uh, ten thousand psi off the stack, so we can get to very, very um, high pressures uh, straight from the stack. So, imagine you've got we've got oxygen coming off at ambient, and we've got hydrogen coming off at ten thousand psi, which is a remarkable thing. So we can we want one of the few companies who can do that kind of differential pressure performance from a from a from an electrolyzer stack, um, and uh, uh, so we, we we are also developing uh, straight electrochemical compression technology. So the uh, where where you where you uh, uh, it's not an electrolyzer stack, but it's a it's a very similar stack where you feed hydrogen in, and out comes hydrogen at pressure. So that's another technology that we're working on. In both cases, we're taking going up to ten thousand, twelve thousand psi. And, and when do you think that'll become economically viable um, to to actually 
use that technology without going bankrupt trying to uh, build it or buy it? Well, the, 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 for, for real commercial markets in electrolysis, we don't think that's where the market is going to be because you're right, the, the, the economic challenges of, of building a stack which can can uh, deal with those kinds of pressures uh, is safe at those kind of pressures. You need to really reinforce the hardware dramatically over a regular electrolyzer stack to be able to, to deal with those pressures. And you have to have a, a, also to upgrade the, the strength of the whole system. So the economics of doing, uh, of building that into the stack, of, of building that uh, pressure into the stack output compared with taking output from the stack at maybe uh, 200 psi or so and then uh, and then using regular compression to take it up to the level you'd like say for a mobility application or putting it into the into the tank of a car in other words or into a, a train or a boat uh, Typically, that's a more uh, viable economic model, and we don't think that's going to change. Um, the, the, the actual uh, uh, electrochemical compression technology, though, that's, kind of, that's an interesting technology. We haven't done the full techno-economic analysis to, to uh, understand exactly what the, uh, f- uh, how long it's going to take us to get to commercial viability. We're very interested in that, though. Whenever you speak to people who run um, filling hydrogen filling stations uh, uh, and have, have experience of using traditional compressors to take hydrogen to very high pressures, that's the they absolutely hate it. They, you know, that's that's the, the, the they keep, have to keep uh, refitting them. They break down. They, it's it's really tough. So they, everyone is really keen to find a better solution. So we're very optimistic about our electrochemical compression. Mm. Got a little way to go though before it's uh, ready for the commercial market. Yeah, you've got that right, Paul. If you have something else, just blurt it out, and I'll, I'll say it to Andy over the phone. Sure. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's, it's it's incredibly impressive that they're getting differential pressures like that at 700 bar and above. Um, I'd love to know how they seal their stacks to be able to do that. Uh, secondly, I agree with them completely. Compression is the Achilles heel of the hydrogen industry. Uh, but what typically we've seen is that electrochemical compression tends to suffer on throughput. Um, whereas mechanical compression can keep up a little bit better. Uh, ask him about the throughput capability. Yeah, he was. Uh, Paul was saying that between the electrochemical and the mechanical compression, the through, throughput capability um, is different. And if you guys have found that out in your research as well, and we both agree that the uh, compression has been the Achilles heel of hydrogen uh, dispensers uh, forever and ever. It's just the one thing that we we hear you can pressurize off the stack, and Paul says, uh, "How do you seal your stack?" And um, you know, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. We know it's it's kind of the tough spot to get by. Ha. Um, so, so the, the, well, the, the 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 question of how we seal our stack, you know, that's getting into very uh, very important IP uh, from the point of view of uh, stack sealing. But that's, uh, you know, we have 30, 30 plus years, as you heard, of experience in building electrolyzers, PAM electrolyzer stacks. And we have, we have the, we've pushed the limits of PAM technology, Stan, further than anybody else in the world. So we've done more advanced technology programs, uh, not just pressures, but lightweight technology for, for aerospace. Uh, we've done uh, ultra um, ultra uh, uh, thin membranes for use in technology. We've done very high temperature operation. The thinner the membrane in, in the in the electrolyzer, and the higher the temperature, the more efficient the electrolyzer is. So we have more experience of doing of doing uh, these extreme uh, extremes of operation. Uh, because we've been asked by NASA or asked by the Navy to, to really push the technical envelope. So there's no one in the world who knows more about how to make a, you know, a, a world-class, high-performing stack than, than GINA ELX, and that's critical for our market success because the ability to, 
to use thinner membranes and run at higher temperatures, run at higher current densities. All those things ultimately are going to lead us to being the lowest cost uh, solution provider in the market. The best stack leads to the best system. Gina ELX has the best systems. And ultimately, because of our performance capabilities, we will be able to offer the lowest cost system to the end customer. And of course, at the end of the day, that's, that's really what is going to drive the market. The market is, is hungry for lower cost electrolysis solutions so that, uh, so that the hydrogen economy can really get moving. Uh, another thing that we talked about a little bit earlier that seems to be uh, really important, uh, in my mind anyway, is the ability to go to gigawatt scale production of hydrogen uh, so that we can use electrolyzers for grid. Um, here in Hawaii, we have a mandate to go to all renewable energy in our grid by 2045. And to make that yeah. happen, we need an incredible amount of energy storage to move the hydrogen or move the energy from one island to another. We've looked at cables, yeah, yeah. we've looked at all kinds of things, and batteries don't hack it. But hydrogen, yeah. either liquid hydrogen or ammonia would do it. And that gigawatt stack is really critical. Can you tell us a little bit about your work on the gigawatt scale? Yeah, sure. But, but uh, let me just echo what you said first. I, I mean, I think increasingly the world is recognizing that there's a critical place for hydrogen in energy storage and in uh, as we switch to renewable energy in general worldwide, there's a critical role for hydrogen to play initially as a as a uh, storage vehicle and then of course also as a source of energy in energy applications directly. Uh, so there's an enormous market for hydrogen, and uh, the, tomorrow that market is going to be green hydrogen, renewable energy using electrolyzers. And you're absolutely right. The critical thing for us is to scale scale our, 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 our business, scale our manufacturing. Um, it's both scale in terms of the stacks themselves and the systems. So we, we launched last year or uh, at the end of 2019, we launched our megawatt stack. So our current workhorse stack is about 150 kilowatt stack. And now, now we have the megawatt stack, which is a uh, we we expect in a couple of years to be able to upgrade to a two megawatt stack. And then, of course, we put we'll, we'll be, be putting multiple stacks together to make uh, five and ten and twenty megawatt systems. Uh, and then these are all modules which can be combined to make absolutely uh, enormous the, the kind of uh, uh, multi um, uh, multi megawatt systems, hundred megawatt system, two hundred megawatt systems that are necessary for some major industrial applications, such as ammonia, as you mentioned. Also, in the oil refining space, they use massive uh, hydrogen, massive amounts of hydrogen. Um, hey, Andy, and I'm going to so I'm going to interrupt for a second. And ask Eric to throw up the megawatt uh, image for us. Oh, great. Is that the megawatt stack that you're putting up? Yeah, there? we're going to see if he can, if Eric can bring that image up. There we go. It's up on the screen now. Mm -hmm. So this is the megawatt scale that uh, image that you sent us that Geener makes. That's exactly right. That's what we call that uh, Allagash stack. That at the moment we're, we're on the market with that as a one megawatt stack, but it's a platform that will we will, as I said, expand to two megawatts in a in a over a couple of years as we increase current density and add more uh, and add more cells to the stack. And uh, so that's just and that's just the beginning. We put multiple stacks together in in larger systems, and then we put multiple systems together for major for major uh, installations. And we are getting inquiries now, routinely getting inquiries, not just for five megawatt, 10 megawatt, 20 megawatt systems, but for 100 megawatt systems, 200 megawatt systems, for people who are, uh, are looking at uh, are looking at electrolysis as a, as a viable economic solution for, for uh, major industrial applications, as I mentioned. So this is, this is uh, the, the market is accelerating fast. Uh, it's so great that Hawaii has, has a commitment to be fully renewable by 2045. Uh, you were, you were, you. I think you, that happened about 2000. That was two or three years ago. You made that commitment. About two years but ago. Today, yeah. 
So but today, now 19 U.S. states have made a commitment to be 100% renewable by 2040, 2045 in that range. And so there's really there's real momentum behind, and of course also over in Europe. We, we're doing a great project with some friends, uh, colleagues in in um, in uh, Holland, where Holland is closed down, is closing down its major gas field because of earthquake activity. So that, and they have great renewable, uh, great renewable su- uh, supply of, of wind, and the, and the, and the key thing we're doing with the, with the guys in Holland is we're actually integrating the the turbine, the wind turbine, together directly with the uh, PAM electrolyzer, and that means we can operate everything more efficiently. We can we can reduce the cost actually of the of the wind turbine and of our electrolyzer because there's some componentry we can just we don't need. Uh, we can operate the wind turbine more more effectively. And uh, what you have then is actually the, the, the wind turbine is basically a hydrogen turbine. That's the concept that we're we're working on there. On a, in a, on a we're gonna, we hope to be uh, doing a, a, the, launching that project this year, and uh, it should be about a two megawatt demonstration site. And that when that takes off, that's going to be absolutely huge, absolutely huge. And we're going to be bringing the high. If we if we uh, do that offshore, we'll be bringing the hydrogen onshore in pipes, uh, Stan. So that's that's part of the answer to distribution distributing energy around uh, around the world. There's going to be hydrogen pipelines. Um, right. So uh, that's a, that's a really exciting project, and we're working with another partner from from Spain, actually originally based in Spain, but which has a project in California to do a renewable energy storage uh, demonstration about it. Again, another two megawatt, right. and another project in Florida with a Florida project with uh, Orlando Utilities Commission and General Motors, where we're doing a, another uh, solar storage project with some GM fuel cells involved. So there's lots of great projects and the scale is, as you say, but coming back to scale, ultimately we have to drive costs down and we have to be able to address the real, the massive opportunities in the, in the energy market. And so it's all gonna be all about scaling up, scaling up the size of the, size of the stack and scaling up the size of our systems and scaling up our manufacturing so that we can we are competitive we 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 can reduce cost and be super competitive in the marketplace uh let me say one more thing one more thing on this topic you know, the, the the cost of hydrogen today hydrogen is a massive market for hydrogen today in the world made from reforming natural gas and and coal right and that's how they make hydrogen today uh and it's incredibly carbon uh, intensive it's a major source of carbon uh so we've got to, we've got to uh we've got to replace that that gray hydrogen that carbon intensive hydrogen with green hydrogen hydrogen from made from renewable energy and uh we're on a we're we're, we're on a path to driving our cost down of our stacks down so that as renewable costs come down and our stack costs and stack and system costs come down, we can we can already see that in 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 uh, two or three years we can be competitive in many places with grey hydrogen, with traditional um, carbon intensive hydrogen, uh, and and. In five years' time, we think we can be below the cost of grey hydrogen in in many locations. So this is a this is fantastic news for uh, for uh, for for the uh, climate, for uh, for the hydrogen economy in general. Um, this is this this is real and it's and it's happening. But it does all depend on scale. You're quite right. Well, and yeah, we're we're coming up on our stop time. And I wanted to thank you so much for spending some time with us. And if Paul has any other burning questions, if he can uh, send them over to me shortly, we'll, we'll go ahead, Paul. No, I was just going to say it's interesting, Andy, that you know, your stacks are rectangular and not cylindrical to get those types of pressures. And I was under the impression that in the EU, um, especially in Germany, Stacks are treated as pressure vessels, and they had to be cylindrical. Uh, apparently, that's not true. Can you comment on that? Yeah, Paul's asking Andy. 
he, he, we didn't show the pictures of your smaller stacks, but they're all cylindrical. And your megawatt stack is uh, more like a box. And Paul's saying that uh, in the European Union, they, they consider cell stacks as uh, pressure vessels, and they're pretty much driven to the cylindrical shape. Uh, can, I, I have a, one final question for you, but if you can answer Paul's on the, how come you went to a, a more square stack or rectangular stack. And then I had a question about whether Giner, Giner is um, in the hydrogen council yet. <laughs> That's a good question. So both are very good questions. So yes, we uh, in Europe you have to uh, meet all the PED guidelines, and indeed our Allagash stack, the rectangular stack, absolutely was designed very much with that in mind. So we've been able to to achieve the uh, all all the uh, standards necessary to, to supply to sell in Europe with a rectangular stack. And, and the advantage of being able to do that is from the point of view of the uh, materials, uh, it's a much more efficient uh, shape uh, from the point of view of, of maximum usage of the, uh, of the materials that go into, the, into the, each cell, uh, some of which, as you know, uh, uh, at least at, at the current scales were, were working. Uh, some of these are quite expensive materials yeah. at the moment. Yes. Uh, so yes, so uh, good question, Paul. But but the, uh, our, our, uh, our, this is the, the best architecture to get the overall lowest cost from the point of view of all the, all the factors that go into the into the calculations. All right, Andy, I'm um, I'm going to interrupt for one second and have Eric throw yeah. up the uh, Starfire video loop so you can answer the uh, the um, hydrogen uh, council question while we run a, a separate video that we took in Paul's oh. shop yesterday. But uh, are you guys oh, part of the Hydrogen Council yet? No, not yet. We're, that's something we, they, they've just released a great report today talking about the uh, future. It, it was released in Brussels today in Europe, and it's a very uh, produced by McKinsey, which is a, a really top-class consulting firm. And they, it's a very optimistic view of the viability of green hydrogen and hydrogen in general for, for, for a large part of, uh, of the hydrogen market. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, also a, a uh, rallying call behind the need to, for, for investment and regulations to support the growth of the market because it's, it's going to take some significant investment to, dri to, to drive the scale and to drive the cost down and to make, it, to make this uh, fully viable in a timely way. Uh, so that's very exciting, and, and that's something we, we, we need to get on board there with the Hydrogen Council. I agree. As a, as a, small, as a small company, you have to pick and choose, and there's not there's a, uh, we, 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 uh, we put a, a lot of effort and most of our funding into driving our product forward at the moment. Uh, being part of these ind the bigger industry movement is something we've got to step up to, and uh, increasing our marketing activity is something that's going to be a key part of our of our uh, of our business uh, activities going forward. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. Well, we're pretty much out of time, and I want to thank you again, Andy. And we'll we'll try again with our technology here and get you on a later show where we can talk to you in person. And thanks to Paul Pontio and Blue Planet for hosting us here on the Big Island. And for Paul for participating on this moonshot of a, a telecast. And uh, until next week, uh, Stan the Energy Man signing off. Aloha. All right, Andy. Thank you so much. Andy.